Hello, everyone. On behalf of the United Nations Global Compact and Shift, welcome to today's webinar on integrating human rights considerations into mergers and acquisitions. My name is Shiva Chandra, and I'm a manager of human rights, legal, and integrity at the United Nations Global Compact. Thanks for joining us. So today's webinar is, is based on um, a document of a report that is prepared by Shift. Um, and for those of you that can see it, there's a there is a um, pane on your control panel called Handout. If you expand that, you'll be able to download Shift's report uh, based on um, this webinar. So I do encourage you to take a look at that either after the webinar um, or when you have some time. This is kind of is kind of an overview of that document, but the added feature is that we have some great experiences from two companies that will be joining us and speaking about their own experiences integrating human rights into M&A deals. Um, so just as background, that information is available to you. Um, but as you know, buying and selling companies often inv involves human rights risks. When a company acquires another, it can inherit human rights risks that a target company has not yet resolved. And where it sells business, it passes the responsibility to respect human rights over to the buyer. Companies are beginning to recognize that integrating social considerations into M&A deals leads to long-term success of such deals. And we'll hear about the experiences of two companies on that point. So with that background, I'd like to now turn it over um, to, to look at today's agenda. So we'll start with some brief introductory remarks about the Global Compact for those of you who are unfamiliar with our work. Um, I'll then turn it over to Anna Trippanel from SHIFT to provide us with an overview of the M&A process with some key lessons learned. Um, we'll then hear from two companies about their experiences working on M&A. Um, and then finally, we'll have a Q&A session uh, during which we'll invite everyone in the audience to submit questions to the panelists before we finally wrap up. And just on the point on questions, I'd just like to bring your attention to the slide, which indicates how you can submit questions to us. Um, while we'll be addressing the questions during the end, uh, during the Q&A session, um, we do encourage everyone to submit questions to us throughout the webinar. And to do so, you can type in a question in the questions pane on your GoToWebinar control panel marked by the letter A on the screen. Um, please also indicate to whom the question should be addressed. And if you're experiencing any technical difficulties during the webinar, please let us know by typing a message in the questions pane or raising your virtual hand marked by the letter B on the screen. So for those of you who are not familiar with the Global Compact, um, we are the UN's Corporate Sustainability Initiative, calling on companies to operate ethically and respect 10 universal principles on human rights, labor, the environment, and anti-corruption by integrating these principles into corporate policies and practices, shown on the screen on the left. We also encourage companies to explore opportunities to support UN goals, such as the recently adopted Sustainable Development Goals, recognizing, however, that support for UN goals is a voluntary complement and not substitute for the responsibility to respect universal principles. We are the main UN initiative for engaging with the private sector and the largest corporate sustainability initiative in the world, with over 8,000 companies and 4,000 non-business signatories based in 160 countries. As part of a company's commitment to the UN Global Compact, it must submit an annual statement of communicating progress on meeting our 10 principles. As you can see on the screen, the first two principles of the UN Global Compact relate to human rights and call on businesses to respect and support the protection of internationally proclaimed human rights and make sure they are not complicit in human rights abuses. The corporate responsibility to respect human rights found in the UN Global Compact's principles is the same corporate responsibility to respect human rights found in the guiding principles on business and human rights, which were endorsed by the UN Human Rights Council in 2011. The UN Global Compact uh, reinforces this requirement of respect, but as mentioned before, also encourages companies to explore opportunities to take additional voluntary action to support human rights, whether through core business activities, strategic social investments, public policy, engagement and advocacy, or partnership and, or collective action. It's important to remember that the support for human rights is a voluntary complement and not a substitute for the requirement to respect human rights elaborated in the guiding principles, which applies to all businesses wherever they operate and whether or not they're in the UN Global Compact. 
So with that introduction to the Global Compact, I'd like to now hand it over to Anna for an overview of the M&A process with a focus on human rights considerations. So Anna, over to you. Thank you, Shuba. Good morning, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I'm so delighted that um, so many of you were able to take an hour out of your busy day to come and chat with us about M&A and human rights. This is an area that is particularly close to my heart. I lateraled over from the World Bank to a major law firm in New York and was practicing as an M&A lawyer, basically specializing in um, advising European and American companies on M&A transactions overseas, as well as joint ventures and other business transactions. So at the World Bank, specializing in the Millennium Development Goals in Fragile States, I obviously had good exposure to the realities on the ground. And I was really struck when I started to practice law at the blinkers that I was asked to put on as an M&A lawyer, that my role was really looking at legal compliance. And regardless of whether I was advising a transaction in the UK or in Papua New Guinea or in Ethiopia, really my role was to advise my clients on you know, what the law said and whether my target or the company I was selling to you know, was seen as compliant with local laws. So that's why I joined John Ruggie um, and his team at the Harvard Kennedy School to bring the corporate lawyer's perspective, which I thought was so critical, um, to, to input that perspective into the second pillar of the UN guiding principles, which is, of course, the corporate responsibility to respect human rights. Fortunately, since that time, 10 years ago, things have changed. Things have changed a lot. And today we have leading companies really, really getting to grips on what human rights means for them in their M&A practices. And I'm delighted to have two of those companies on the call with us today. And I'll be introducing them in a little while. Before I delve into some of the key learnings from my work with M&A teams over the past four years, I wanted to see if we could test out a feature that Shuba says uh, we might be able to try, which is a poll. Um, and it was to ask you all a couple of questions, and this is just to help me understand what the level of knowledge is on the line um, of M&A, and it will help me tailor my remarks accordingly. So Shuba, let's, let's try this. Uh, the first question I'd like to ask you is, how familiar are you with mergers and acquisitions? Are you very familiar? This is something that you do you know, day in, day out. You eat, sleep, and breathe M&A. Are you somewhat familiar? You work with M&A teams, um, and you know what M&A is about. Um, or are you not at all, but of course interested, you're on this call, but you know, M&A is not something you do day to day. Um, so I'll hand over to Shuba to lead this poll. Sure, so we're already getting a number of responses. Um, so we'll close the poll in about 10 seconds. So we'll close it in five, four, three, two, one. So based on the answers, it sounds that it seems like 23% are very familiar, 38% are somewhat familiar, and 38% are not at all familiar but interested. And that's based on the 81% of folks that have voted. Okay, perfect. Well, that's great. That's sort of one third, one third, one third. Um, and that, yeah, that's, that's a really good um, Really good to know that. Okay, thank you. Next question um, is for those who are working in companies or, or working closely with companies, you know, feel free to respond to. Uh, where is your company right now in terms of integrating human rights into its M&A processes? Do you feel like you're very advanced? This is something you're absolutely on board with and you're you know, moving this forward. Somewhat advanced, there's been some reflection internally and you know, maybe some actions taken, but this is still quite new or not at all. This really is just something you're considering um, to do maybe in, in the future. Shuba, let me hand Great. over to you. Yeah, so we'll close the poll in 10 seconds. So we'll close it in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1.
So you should be able to see kind of the results on the screen now. Um, so we have seen that only 65 people that 65 percent of those on, online that have voted, but uh, nine percent have shared that they're very advanced. 50 percent said that they have some they're somewhat advanced, and 41 percent said that they're not at all or just starting. Great, thank you. Well, that's really great to hear, especially in the Q&A session later on. It'd be great to hear from others on the call as well in terms of your experiences and things that um, have helped you in this process as well. So thank you for sharing that. Okay, so let's delve into it um, from my side. Um, what does considering human rights during M&A mean? So in short, this refers to equipping the M&A team to identify salient human rights issues in the course of due diligence, to prioritize the issues for action um, along with, with other issues um, that need to be prioritized in the course of due diligence, and address, take action on the issues that have been identified during due diligence. Now this, si this slide seems really simple, doesn't it? It's really identifying, prioritizing, and addressing. We, we know that we do this in the course of due diligence, but I must say it's something that is often missed when companies are starting out in this process. Often there's a focus on what are the inputs, what's the information that I need to look at as a company, and how do I improve you know, that information, how do I look at it differently, but often you know, it we can't, what's the point of having all that information if we don't act on it in a different way? So, so these three components are really important to consider as, as companies are starting out in integrating human rights into M&A. So I wanted to just take a little bit of a step back and talk about you know, why this is hard. Um, next slide, please, Shuba. For, for those who are working on this, um, you yeah, know, this isn't easy, and um, it's not easy for any company I've worked with. Of course, there are, you know, anyone who's worked on an M&A transaction knows just how stressful these things are, and how little sleep you get when you're on the M&A team. It's often a very short time frame to conduct due diligence, to negotiate, and to sign the contract. Uh, there are frequently very high confidentiality constraints, even within your own company. Sometimes you're the only one who knows. You know, others in your legal department aren't allowed to know. Um, there's a very small subset of people in the company that are privy to what's going on. Um, you rely on information that comes in from the target company if it's, you know, if it's an acquisition or if it's a divestiture. You know, depending, you can get information from the from the one that's buying your business assets. You get information from maybe your investment firm, your investment bank, as well as um, a local council on the ground. But you, the kinds of inputs you can rely upon are, are small, but in light of the very, very um, high confidentiality restraints that exist in general. The baseline, as we know, is, is, is often, uh, most of the times, I'm not saying every time, but most of the time, legal compliance, meaning that, you know, as an M&A team, I'm looking at, well, has, has the law been violated on the ground? Is there a legal compliance issue I need to know about? Do I need to bring in local counsel to help me on this? The um, M&A lawyer is frequently the glue that brings together all the various specialties within the M&A team. The M&A lawyer can liaise with you know, the tax specialist or the intellectual property specialist or the human resources specialist. So the M&A lawyer often has a very good view and, and visibility as to all of the different areas of the transaction. But at the same time, there often can be silos that happen within companies. Um, often the M&A team, you know, from my experience, isn't necessarily aware of why the company as a whole has decided to go into this, into this business transaction. What's the business impetus for, for doing this, this transaction? It's, it's often, well, you know, if I'm asked to do this transaction, obviously the business has decided that this is a good thing for the business, and the business must have weighed the pros and the cons of going into this new jurisdiction or into this new um, business venture. The, the focus is, is allocation of risk. You know, we know when we're, you know, we're trained and when we advise as lawyers, uh, we, we seek to protect our company against risks. We seek to allocate those risks to the other side. It's not, you know, obviously it's not necessarily about trying to solve issues together. So, you know, for example, um, it, would be, it would make better sense for me to um, put money into an escrow to fight possible litigation rather than possibly putting money into a remedy mechanism to try and address the root cause. That's just not what M&A is structured to do. 
So, so there are obstacles to considering human rights in M&A, um, but at the same time, we see that companies are really finding very innovative ways to work within these constraints to try and, and, and change the boundaries of M&A to be able to integrate consideration for human rights. And I'm going to highlight very briefly the five key takeaways that I believe are important um, for today's webinar uh, that, I, that I think can apply across the board, that can, maybe can help you in your thinking on this. Um, obviously, you know, every company will address this differently. It's highly dependent on the company's existing processes, on its sector, the kinds of people it has in the company working on M&A, and of course, its human rights risk profile. So I do not want to suggest that this applies you know, you know, to the letter for all companies. This really is sort of some reflections um, based across or work across different kinds of companies. So number one, let's go to the next slide, Shuba. Thank you. This is really important. Um, yeah, there's no point in engaging in this work if the M&A team or people in the M&A team don't see the value of it. You know, why are we thinking about human rights? So number one for any company really is trying to see how you can make the business case and tailor it to your own company. Where is your company in terms of its vision? Uh, you know, in terms of its vision of corporate strategy, is it is seeking to expand through this through these strategic acquisitions? Is it seeking to um, rather narrow its focus to really focus on its core business, so it's divesting. Where is it going over the next five, ten years? And you can tailor your examples accordingly. Examples, of course, exist in the public domain of failed transactions or transactions that have cost a lot more because human rights were not considered at the outset. But in my experience, the most powerful examples are those that come from the companies themselves. And often the companies don't know that they sit on a number of very relevant examples. And the key is to bring those examples out. They haven't been connected to human rights or people know them, but you know, they're working day to day and they haven't necessarily shared them with others in the company. So finding a process to really extract those examples from within the company helps considerably in bringing you know, the M&A team along in, in wanting to do this. Of course, um, you know, what are the drivers for your, is it for your company? You know, is it about cost, saving costs? Okay, find examples where companies have saved costs from doing this. Is it about you know, legal risks? Is it about reputational risks, being on the headline? Um, there are lots of different um, angles that one can take to make the case. And I'm going to ask Ericsson and Total later on to share a little bit what are the kinds of things that they found worked for them. The objective here is that really it's the M&A team that's leading this work with input, of course, from others in the business and importantly from the sustainability or corporate responsibility or human rights function. Takeaway number two. This is the importance of really and streamlining this, adding it onto the company's existing corporate processes. It really shouldn't be something completely new. M&A is about identifying risks already. Uh, that's what people do in M&A. We identify risks and we try and address those risks. So obviously this isn't new, but it's a, it's a new kind of risk that is being identified and addressed. So um, the point here is about mapping out how the company is already looking at risk how it's looking at risk in terms of its due diligence, how it's conducting you know, research on the target or on um, the buyer, if it's an acquisition, if it's a divestiture, how it's considering the issues, how it's then prioritizing those issues, and then how it's addressing those issues. And all across that spectrum of process, there are things that actually might be very similar to looking at human rights risks and things that will be very different. And in the work that I've been doing with companies, you definitely see some things coming out um, across, across the board with these companies. One of the key, yeah, and I've lost, listed a few examples here, um, when we're looking at you know, legal compliance, there are countries where that just definitely will not be enough. You know, in Bolivia, where the legal age is 10, is that really what a company wants if they're acquiring a company in Bolivia? Of course not. They want higher standards. And so the legal, you know, compliance with legal um, the national labor standards in a contract is actually quite meaningless. So it's about looking beyond legal compliance and specifically in certain higher risk countries. 
It's about having a different lens to existing information. Um, of course, legal title to land you know, is something we look at, but maybe that legal title to land isn't valid because of what the communities think about this legal title to land. How can we try and get a sense of that? That would have helped Meridian Gold save $320 million that it lost when it acquired a site that the communities um, knew they didn't want to be used for open pit gold mining. Severity of impact is a factor in prioritization. This basically means that it could be that you find something in your due diligence that doesn't arise to the level of a huge sort of material risk as we understand it in financial terms. It's not a huge dollar amount, but it impacts a lot of people. And you know, a company that's committed to respecting human rights has also committed to addressing those really severe impacts that comes up in its due diligence as well, to the extent it's taking that on after its transaction. And how you address is different. You know, it's, it is about seeking to address the root cause in addition to allocating legal risk. And I have an example of a South African company. I remember saying, you know, we've been fighting litigation. This is our seventh lawsuit. Uh, we think we'll win. But boy, you know, do we wish we'd put money to the side to try and address the root cause at the beginning? We, we wish we'd done that. So when we think about the UNGP's modes of involvement, it is, very, it is sometimes very different to the way in which lawyers are trained in terms of legal liability. So it's important for m and teams to consider that there are, two len there are two different angles to this, legal liability as well as modes of responsibility under the UN guiding principles. I won't go into that um, here, but there, there are tables in the, the article that I wrote which, which, tr which tries to sort of just give a brief snapshot of what that means. Takeaway number three, this is absolutely critical. Um, it's the area that's had the most discussion in all of my work on M&A. Who is responsible for what? Is it the M&A lawyer who's responsible now for human rights? Is this a new responsibility? You know, they can say, well, no, you know, human rights is not my specialty. I'm specialized in m and I'm specialized in corporate law, so this surely isn't my responsibility. Then others can say, yes, but you know, your human rights law is part of law, and this is also something you should be looking at. There are lots of different conversations that go on in companies in terms of where the responsibilities lie. And there's no one-size-fits-all um, approach. It will depend on the company's structure. Um, you know, there might be a larger role for lawyers if there isn't a, another team working on human rights in the company. Uh, it may depend on the, on the risk of the transaction. You might bring in some external support if the risks are higher. But I'll just flag that, you know, sort of leading best practice in this for large companies, of course for smaller companies it will be different, is um, the ability to equip specific functions. So specific functions being you know, human resources, environmental, intellectual property, these are all specialties that work in M&A transactions that they are empowered to also identify risks to people as part of their day-to-day. -day, right? If I'm looking at real estate leases, maybe if I'm looking at a deal in Bangladesh that isn't enough, maybe I also need to be looking at structural safety of buildings. That's just an example of how specific functions can work on this. Lawyers are equipped to act as wise counselors, which means identifying where there are potential gaps between legal risks and human rights risks. In-house in human rights expertise, to the extent it exists, can be brought in where human rights risks are higher, and in particular, I'm trying to identify where there might be issues at the outset, and as I mentioned, additional external expertise with specific caveats. It has to be, of course, you know, maybe on a no-names basis, or um, there are lots of things you can do to still try and weave in additional external expertise when time is tight and in light of high confidentiality. So I think my key takeaway there is about having that conversation with the company as to who plays what role within the M&A team, and that each one has a, plays a, a you know, there's a piece of the puzzle here, each one holds a piece of the puzzle. Very briefly, my fourth takeaway um, is linked to this actually, it's about building channels. Um, definitely I've noticed a lot of silos in this work, you know, the M&A lawyers, the M&A team um, aren't necessarily aware of what's going on, you know, in, in other departments and vice versa, you know, so it could be that sustainability team is working very much on specific countries and the M&A team would benefit from that knowledge. It could be that, you know, the M&A team, once a transaction has taken place, can give information over to the company to manage risks 
moving forward. For example, I found you know, that the issue of human resources, in I wasn't able to address it in the contract, um, but it's an issue as we acquire, as we integrate this company, you know, company, can you take this on, human resources or integration team, can you take this responsibility on? And, and finally, uh, the link that's often harder to make but is the most important to make is connecting it back to the business's decisions on business development and strategy because obviously it's linked to where the company is seeing its, its expansion um, in terms of future business. And my last point um, is about building capacity. Of course, we all know this is important. Um, M&A professionals you know, have a number of questions when they start working with this. And here are the most common questions that um, I, I have seen them ask me. What are the human rights implications of the information I already receive? I already get information from uh, companies that I'm interested in as a result of um, checklists and questionnaires. So what, are, you know, what's, what does it mean to look at this with the human rights lens? Is there additional information that I also need to be looking at? And if so, where? Where would I get this information? How do I prioritize when I find these issues? How do I assess their materiality, their financial value? And what are the kinds of actions I should be taking uh, as part of the contract discussion? So these are the kinds of questions, you know, of course, workshops are helpful, but um, you know, I think workshops have a really good role to play. You can do hypotheticals, you can do real life case studies, things that have happened to try and really build understanding. At the same time, people move on and it's important to really weave this into the day-to-day -day process of the company. And so that's where uh, a combination of workshops as well as actual guidance notes or, or integration into existing processes and questionnaires and things like that will Will really help the long-term focus of the company on M&A. So let me um, stop there and um, introduce our, um, our speakers here from Ericsson and Total. I'm really delighted um, that we have, um, we have participants from both of these companies who are heavily in, who've been heavily involved in this process from day one and who have extensive insight into it. We have Lisa Edblom from Ericsson, who is Senior Legal Counsel, as well as Camilla goldbeck Lua, who is responsible for human rights in Ericsson's sustainability and corporate responsibility responsibility department. From Total, we have Isabel Salon, who is VP for Legal M&A and Finance within Total. We have Malvina Letelier, who is counsel within uh, Isabel's department, also focused on M&A and finance. And Adebola Ogunladi, who is responsible for human rights within Total's legal department. Um, it's the compliance and CSR department within Total. So um, thank you, um, all of you, for joining us today. I wanted to start with you, Lisa, um, and Camilla from Ericsson, and ask you, what were the drivers for your company to look at human rights in the M&A context? How were you able to make the business case, the case for this, to, this work to get started? Well, thank you very much for this, Anna. This is Camilla, uh, who will start the, the, this description, and then I will, will hand over to Lisa. Uh, it's It's cutting out for me. Can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Yeah. So th there's a long tradition. I mean, we, this is the 23rd year that we are reporting on sustainability and corporate responsibility issues. And, and, and we have, for example, also th this year for the second year around reported according to the UN Guiding Principles reporting framework. So, you know, there's an openness uh, to, to address new issues that, that are coming up on the sustainability horizon. So I think that, that that's one important issue to, to keep, um, keep in mind. Uh, we also have a, a clear commitment in our code of conduct and, and our code of business ethics, which are applicable for, for our employees and the code of conduct for our employees as well as our suppliers. And in this one, we are... Uh, Say, stating that we have a um, commitment to implement the UN guiding principles throughout our business operations. And we are also listing our salient human rights issues. And, and this is also then being reflected uh, in, in the M&A process. So how do we then operationalize all these uh, policy commitments? Well, we decided to, to go through the already existing processes that we have and see whether or not they are containing a human rights lens or, or if they are taking human rights issues into consideration. So 
Obviously, we have a responsible sourcing organization, which is looking at the implementation of the code of conduct. That's in place since, since several years back. We have another process looking at sales compliance and, and risks with human rights issues when we are selling. And then a year and a half ago, we identified within the company that, that we also needed to address human rights issues in a better way uh, than, than previously done um, in, in the merger and acquisition process. So this gap was identified within the company. Uh, and then we, we started the communication with SHIFT. And, and Lisa is now going to describe a little bit more how we went about this process. Yes. Um, and then um, from the human, uh, from the sorry, MA perspective, where I work, uh, also before this more structured work began, we of course had human rights as a, a within the compliance framework and therefore on the agenda. But as as Anna you said in your takeaways, it was very much focused on legal compliance, and we didn't approach it in the structured way. The work Camilla refers to became a catalyst for us to do. Um, so throughout that work, we adopted a more structured approach to identifying and addressing human rights risks in M&A processes or transactions as they were perceived to pose a specific risk. <clears throat> I can also mention that I think in the past, we kind of patted our backs and placed a great reliance on the integration and post-merger integration process. Uh, and and uh, I think we kind of told ourselves a bit that uh, if there were uh, discrepancies or human rights violations which went beyond legal compliance, those would be healed or remedied as part of the post-merger integration process since Ericsson has very firm policies and principles in place to make sure that we observe human rights in our operations and throughout the integration the the acquired business will become subject to those. Uh, but I think we've also learned that we have to have a more proactive approach and that we have we are trying to ensure by adopting this new new kind of way of approaching the issue. <coughs> I apologize for my voice. I hope you can hear me. Thank you. Thanks, Camilla Lisa. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. And let me hand over to you, Isabel Malvina and Adebola from Total, with the same question about the drivers for your company to look at human rights in this context. Yeah, thank you, Hannah, and thanks everyone. Um, in terms of um, the drivers for Total, um, um, for the framework, um, human rights actually is one of our three uh, priority business principles at Total, and that's clearly um, stated in our code of conduct. Um, in addition, um, in the same code of conduct, Total commits to um, adhere to the principles of the UNGPs. Um, and talking about the tone from the top, um, our executive committee, um, the Total Group's executive committee, um, has actually given instructions that um, lawyers and other um, participants um, in business within the group should consider um, the human rights implications of their work. Um, as a matter of managing existing and future um, risks um, for the company. Um, so Isabel will give the um, M&A perspective on the drivers. Yes, because obviously beyond the, the, the general principles that are now embodied in a number of uh, internal documents within Total, I would say that one of the most powerful drivers for the M&A lawyers in, in the oil and gas industries has been the recent concrete examples uh, of, of what we saw as as uh, having potential negative consequences for our business and should lead us to effectively pay a lot of attention to these particular issues in M&A transactions uh, and transactions generally. Um, and, and just to give you an example, a couple of examples of with which uh, I am particularly familiar, um, in, in, uh, in Western Australia, for example, where we had set a, a joint venture with a Japanese partner uh, called Impex, um, we spend a lot of time in the uh, early stages of the project investigating these various issues with some of our, of our internal experts and, 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 uh, and uh, external agencies. And uh, the, the result of all that, and including very concrete uh, illustration, the, uh, the, the dialogue that we led with our Japanese partner with the local people, the Aborigines, with respect to the uh, uh, settlement of, of certain port facilities, how we would remove uh, an ancient symmetry, how we would make sure that we would be able to effectively uh, provide some um, uh, better housing 
uh, and, and employment conditions to all of them, this actually uh, enabled us to um, have a very successful project. We didn't encounter any delay in obtaining further approvals by the various uh, authorities in Australia. Uh, this project is now in operation and we've got a very good and positive feedback uh, from local communities. And we, are, we, we were absolutely convinced through that concrete example that um, paying attention at an early stage to these issues, these human rights issues, would effectively enable us to be more effective uh, and reduce costs in, in the long-term run. So when we, when we came to realize that, and that's just one example among a couple of, or many others to be honest, in, in every continent, uh, either experienced by Total or by some of our competitors, we felt that we needed to provide some concrete guidance to MNA lawyers to help them to effectively ensure that these principles would not remain at the level of principles, but would effectively be integrated in the uh, existing processes uh, followed by them. Uh, for this type of transaction. And, and this is when we turn to shift to try to get some assistance to help us build a tool that would uh, address specifically the concrete needs of total lawyers um, and, and would be a, 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 a pragmatic uh, answer uh, to, to the questions that were raised by them. Thank you very much, um, Adeboda and Isabel. I want, uh, let me ask you the second question, and um, after this I will open it up to Q&A. Um, so I want to ask, I'll start with you, Total. Um, in terms of the key lessons learned for you from this work to date, and I know that you have Melvina in the room as well. Melvina, you were part of all of the interviews that we held uh, with uh, lawyers from you know, marketing and services, as well as refining and chemicals, as well as exploration and production, and we had you know, a number of really great conversations as part of that, and there might be things you can share um, that, you, that we heard there as well. Um, but let me just ask you generally, what, we, what are your key lessons learned for those, um, those in the, the, on, the webinar, on the webinar who are advancing on this? Um, I think that one of the key lessons uh, we uh, get from this experience is that we need to involve uh, as many people as possible, that the only way uh, for them uh, to feel concerned so um, to explain briefly uh, how it uh, happened within Total, uh, within Total we've got a different um, brainstorming group, uh, that uh, legal brainstorming groups that we call the RPG, and there is one which is the uh, MNA RPG, and we decided within this um, RPG to tackle uh, the human rights uh, issue with the help of uh, the human rights department uh, within Total and uh, with the help of SHIFT, you, uh, Anna, um, we started these uh, interviews but not only at the holding level uh, but uh, within the EMP and uh, refining and uh, uh, marketing and services divisions. So we had a very broad view of what people were expecting and what were their issues with uh, the uh, human rights uh, within uh, M&A transactions. And um, I think one other thing which was very good for us uh, in order to have everybody uh, in the same boat and feeling uh, concerned by uh, uh, implementing human rights uh, within the M&A transaction is the workshop we uh, we have done, and uh, it was great because it uh, we, we invited many different people, uh, obviously transactional lawyers, but also operational people. And uh, thanks to this workshop, we, which was very concrete, uh, people started to understand why it was important uh, to uh, figure out how to implement human rights in uh, M&A transactions. It was very concrete, and that's uh, something which is very important. Uh, we don't want uh, an additional uh, layer of rules. We want something that uh, transactional people, lawyers or operational people can implement. Thank you very much, Malvina, for, for that. Um, Ericsson, let me hand over to you for this question of your key lessons learned from this work so far. Yes. Hi, this is, this is Camilla again. Um, I think that there are many lessons that, that one can learn from, from this process, but I think that one of the key ones is actually that, that in our experiences it's very good to use what already exists. So it, was, it didn't make sense for us to invent a specific human rights uh, 
uh, process for, for this uh, within the emerging acquisition process, but rather already using existing processes because that, that way you would be, get better leverage and, and you would include the, the, uh, the question in, in something that already existed. Um, we also found that, that training and, and awareness was needed even though you know, people know what human rights issues are, but many, many times people are thinking about very grave human rights violations. They didn't see um, sm smaller issues um, that, that, that could also be, be of, of, of relevance. So I, I think that that was one of the things we also did within the framework of, of the, uh, because we had a very much similar process to what you had in total with the, the workshop where, where SHIFT was very active and, and thank you very much Anna for that. Uh, I think that was a very good eye-opener for, for the people that we gathered, um, which also included people within the, both lawyers, but also other people that are working with, with M&As uh, within the company. So that, that was also a, a very useful track. Um, and also for us, very much looking at the salient human rights issues, as you pointed out in the beginning, Anna, that, that we have put in place a process where we are focusing on, on the issues that are most at, at relevance for us, and, and those are free, freedom of expression, right to privacy, and labor standards. And, and we have also tailored a process that, that is covering these issues. So I would uh, stop there, unless Lisa has anything additional. No, perhaps we should allow for questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. Well, let me hand over to Shuba to um, lead us through the Q&A session. Hi, Anna. Thanks, everyone, for, your, for um, that great kind of Q&A on kind of the company's experiences thus far. Um, so we do have one question that's come in. Um, yeah, so the, the question is, uh, do you have examples of where human rights considerations have carried heavier weight than, in, um, than other business risks, such as commercial risks? Does anyone want to take that question? I'm, I'm, not, I'm just trying to clarify the question. Um, Anna, is this question about, um, you're saying when human rights have trumped um, other risks, essentially that they have been seen as more important um, as part of transactions? Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. Yes. Um, great, thank you. Um, Total, do you have any examples of this where uh, human rights really um, and if not, I have an example that I know is public for, for you guys relating to the M&A transaction. Um, but do you have any on M&A that you, you can think of? That's the one, that's the one that I had in mind. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, obviously, usually, to be honest, it, it's, a, it's a set of different reasons that would effectively lead us to, um, for example, decide to abandon a transaction. You put them together. Usually, when you start having a human right issue in a given transaction, you, you, you are pretty certain to find some other type of, of similar issues, either around the partner or the seller or, or, or the buyer. Um, so it, it, it is quite difficult to answer positively uh, to, uh, to, to that. There are a couple of concrete examples where this happened, where the risk decided that the risk was too high, uh, including from a reputational point of view, to pursue, uh, to pursue the transactions, and we just uh, abandoned it. But very often, it's more diffuse. Uh, it's just one element of consideration among a, a number of others. Mm. Mm. Thanks, Isabel. Um, what about you, Lisa? Do you have any examples that come to mind of this one? Um, no, I think I would very much share what, what um, uh, our colleague in Total was saying, that it's very much a kind of um, weighted analysis. And, and the idea with the process, and I think that is all a message which is good to also put to the, the organization one is working for. It's not to stop business necessarily, or at all actually, it's to enable it in a responsible manner. So I think we are, of course, sometimes you encounter deal breakers, but that is not how we would normally can we approach those issues. We are of course trying to see how we can remedy them, etc. Uh, but where we have had something at least you, uh, with hindsight, can put an a human rights kind of label on, we have abandoned it as well because it's been so much else. And um, human rights is also often legal compliance and legal compliance is often hard to to find find an appropriate remedy for. Um, but I think focus on, of course, in identification, 
but also to, to tailor a remedial uh, response also to address the root causes. Um, should uh, We always try to explore that first. Mm, thanks, and I just wanted to um, underscore yeah, the, the importance of um, examples where exactly it's not necessarily about stopping the business, but, uh, but it's about movi moving forward, but with other considerations in mind or perhaps with more budget to do certain things. Um, and I think the examples where people have pulled out of transactions can really worry M&A teams because ultimately, of course, that's not what they, you know, they like to hear if transactions aren't going through. And I have one example that's... Um, um, I can anonymize, which is a mining company in the, in the DRC um, who, who was really interested in, in investing, um, buying up a company there. And then, and then they got the um, amnesty report on, on the risks of you know, artisanal mining linked to cobalt, and they got just really worried about the reputational risk, and they pulled out of the deal. And then another company came in and, you know, who had much less sort of um, commitment to human rights. And so you know, the question is, well, you know, would, it, would it have been better if they had committed to the deal, but, but maybe putting considerations in place to try and manage the risks rather than putting out. So it's always a tricky balance. Another example that, that has just come up, it's not M&A, but I think it's a really interesting one, is the fact that BHP Billiton has decided to pull out of all of the joint ventures where they don't have operational control. And this is a decision from this week, and it's because of the risks linked to, uh, we all know, the San Marco joint venture in Brazil, which you know, was the biggest environmental catastrophe in Brazil that happened in November of last year, with um, 19 people killed and dozens injured when the burst tailings dam um, burst. And so BHP, Billiton and Valley didn't actually have control of that joint venture, even though they were joint owners of it. And so the CEO of BHP just decided, well, it's just not worth our risk um, for us. So, so they're withdrawing and instructing all their M&A teams to look at that. So that's another interesting example, um, although it's beyond M&A. Yeah, that's a really great example, um, Anna. I mean, that's, I, I hadn't heard of that one before, so um, certainly something that we should, we should uh, watch for if other companies are going to um, do that as well. Um, I think maybe one question I, I think you can, we could ask our, our panelists is if they have any advice for other companies who are starting out in this process, and maybe if they can speak a little bit to the challenges that they've encountered. Maybe convincing, I think, you know, to your point earlier, Anna, you'd mentioned really stressing the business case for human rights, too, but if there are particular, um, you know, challenges that, uh, that at Total and Ericsson maybe could speak about. At, at, from our, I would say, uh, personal experience in, in um, drafting this guidance and um, uh, getting everyone on board is effectively it's very important not to ignore the practical obstacles that the m and lawyers face effectively in, in, in trying to identify those potential risks. Because obviously the human risks are not really the same type of risk as the one they are usually facing. It's not like, it's not a risk that is attached to the business as such. They, they, they must not look at it from a business perspective, they must look at it from the stakeholders' perspective. And as Anna has, has, has rightly pointed out, this is not the way that m and lawyers were educated. So you need a complete shift of mind, a, a, a new psychology, a new way at looking at things. Um, and, and this is, I think, what will probably take a lot of time for us to, uh, to, to achieve. So it goes you know, through training, awareness, education, that's one thing. Um, and the second uh, effectively practical obstacle is that, uh, and again, that was rightly pointed out by Anna, the confidentiality that surrounds those transactions, especially at the early stage, makes it quasi impossible sometimes to effectively obtain the information that you need to, to make that assessment. And, and to identify a risk, either because you are not allowed to go on site uh, or because um, you're not even allowed to talk potentially to the target company. Um, so e effectively, you, you, you are um, y y you're facing the difficulty of not having the information and nevertheless being required to effectively uh, give some preliminary conclusion as to whether there's any risk attached to the potential, for example, purchase of, a, of an asset or a company. So we're trying to address that within Total by, by exchanging information, by trying to set some, um, some bridges between the various data sources that we've got within the company. For example, our human rights department maintains uh, on a regular basis some uh, practical 
uh, fish, as we call it, like summaries of the various uh, human rights issues that we're facing in different countries. So this can provide a first um, a source of information for MNL lawyers to see what they should be looking at when they're working in a given country. Uh, but of course, without a, a proper investigation and additional due diligence, it's very difficult then to, to form a, a complete opinion on a, on a given transaction. Great, thanks so much. Um, uh, Lisa or Camila, would you like to also comment on that? Um, yes, uh, on challenges. No, I, I can again actually kind of reiterate that. I think um, since we recognize them, since everyone recognizes that human rights kind of spans across all areas, we you can't really have specific, or we perceive that you can't really have specific human rights questions in the due diligence, for example. Instead, you have to have each work stream kind of look at the information they receive with the human rights land, human rights land, uh, with the human rights land, and also add specific questions. And I think that work, you you're working against or with a larger group of stakeholders, which has to be educated and informed. Uh, and as Camilla mentioned, the perception, at least in our company, was very much that human rights is kind of grave violation by state actors. So we've had workshops, and I think we can do more of that of kind of bringing the concept home to our reality uh, in, in kind of tuning. Yeah, you need a different mindset when you interpret the information. If you work in HR and you get the information about attrition rates, you have to think that something could be behind those figures. It could be migrant workers or what have you. So it's kind of, um, we believe that we will come a long way in interpreting the information you would normally request. Uh, from the perspective of a higher level of understanding of the risk uh, in that country and for your industry. So that is the work we are undertaking, but it's a big talk. Super, thank you so much, that was very helpful. Um, one other question that, that's come in that maybe you can speak to. So one of the points that was raised by Anna was the importance of building channels of communication within the company, kind of breaking down silos. And um, uh, you know, one of the questions is, is kind of focused on how how within Total and Ericsson that's happened. It, it sounds like uh, have there been committees that have formed, um, and it sounds like both the, the law, their lawyers uh, and you know, there are a couple of people kind of have um, a role in both the, the legal uh, kind of on the legal team and also on the human rights team. But can you speak a bit about? How that communication is done? Are there committees? Where do you? Where does human rights sit within those companies? As far as Total is concerned, we don't have any. Uh, I would say formal committee in place um, uh, with an objective to share information between the, the, the various expertise. But effectively, through the guidance uh, for human rights in m and transactions. And, and using the existing processes in place within Total, we are we have effectively created that interaction because we have allocated very clearly a role to every single one of the persons involved in an MA transaction. And by identifying who is responsible for that and who has to effectively provide a given information to somebody else to make sure that we can double check and 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 um, uh, effectively uh, have. have uh, assess the issue and have the right conclusion through building these internal processes and coordinating the role of everyone you are effectively forcing an exchange of information um, and, and this is I think what was one of the most uh, 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 important contributions of that guidance uh, and I think from Ericsson let's see if we have Camilla um, uh, yeah. Well, we have um, we haven't formalized. It. We have a very. I mean, Camilla works in the um, sustainability and corporate responsibility department, which has a body of of knowledge in this field. Um, and then we have a sales compliance board, which might be the closest to someone who looks at human rights also in our sales operations or sales the the business. Um, and of course, we can leverage also in the M&A activities from their knowledge. So they are most often in, involved 
uh, because they will have the latest on the countries involved, etc. Um, so I think it it uh, it definitely requires lots of cross communication, but we have identified the various um, kind of parts of the organization which have to be involved, and I think communication is flowing quite well. Very very much uh, Camilla's team and and uh, me as the MMA or my team as MMA lawyers are kind of the hub in making sure that uh, the right stakeholders are involved. Great, that's really helpful to hear, and I think particularly for uh, the individuals on the line that are, are working within companies, they can maybe, I think that, you know, to the point about having clear roles, and that's actually kind of forcing people to communicate is um, a, a really a really good idea, I think, in, in lieu of not having a, a committee. Um, so I think, yeah, both, it's great to hear about both your experiences, um, and, and great to see that there is so much interaction within Ericsson, um, human rights considerations, and within legal. So we're actually very close to ending uh, today's webinar because my time is 10 o'clock New York time. But before we end, I just wanted to take a few minutes to just talk about some of the resources um, before we close and, and also thank our fantastic panelists, uh, both Anna from Shift, uh, who, who developed this um, article on uh, considering human rights and M&A deals, but also um, our colleagues at Total and Ericsson. It's really wonderful to hear input directly from companies on challenges but also successes in this area and we hope that that is a model for other companies um, going forward. But if you are interested in, in looking into this topic in more detail, definitely recommend that you read um, Anna's article which is listed as the first resource on the slide. Um, and, and also we have also developed a note on um, integrating human rights into M&A due diligence process. Um, it was a note that was developed a few years back. And particularly for the lawyers that are on the phone, but um, that are maybe listening to this after the webinar um, in a recording, we do have developed, we've developed a number of uh, resources and also have a portal on engaging the legal profession generally. So not just for the M&A deals, but just encouraging lawyers to be accelerators and, and not the breaks to a lot of these deals and, um, and really looking at not just human rights, but a lot of other considerations as well into um, what a company is doing and being, um, you know, being the voice of, of being a moral compass and being ethical because I think what we're noticing is that companies are no longer just being, or sorry, lawyers are not being asked just to, to um, provide advice on what's legal but also what is right. And um, that's some of the, the lessons that we gleaned in the Guide for General Counsel and, General Counsel and Corporate Sustainability which is listed on the slide as um, resource number three. Um, and there are a few others that I would like to mention, just um, we have a Lawyers of Leaders uh, um, video series and um, a portal on engaging the legal profession for those that are interested. And Harvard Law School also produced a fantastic article about um, lawyers as professionals and as citizens as well. So that's something to uh, keep in mind in case you are interested uh, in reading a little bit more about how you can um, be kind of a champion within your company or in a law firm if you're based in a law firm, for example. So um, just with that, I'd like to close the webinar and, and really thank everybody on the line um, for tuning in. I know we're, we started a little late and we're running a little late um, for listening in and um, again to our fantastic panelists and to our core organizers, Shift, um, for putting together this webinar. So Anna, I don't know if you have any less, uh, less uh, points or closing remarks to make. Thanks so much, Shubha. And um, just one closing remark from my end, um, in addition to thanking all of you for joining us today. Um, it was great, actually, to see the results of the poll at the beginning, that um, you know, half of you are advancing on integrating human rights, and 9% of you very advanced. That's really encouraging to hear. Um, and just to close by saying that, of course, M&A teams are important, um, but great um, to, to, in terms of the company's commitment to respect human rights, you know, where, where are the lawyers that can be, where can the lawyers be the most helpful? And, you know, in a power well, it might be the procurement contracts, in oil and gas it might be joint venture contracts, in ICT it might be customer contracts, that definitely this work on M&A is, is sort of an opening, um, if that hasn't taken place already, to other lawyers in the company really playing a role in helping the company um, you know, build its leverage to, to respect human rights. So I'll just, I'll just conclude on that. Thank you very much, Ericsson and Total, for joining us today, and thanks to all of you for, for listening in. Thank you. Thank you.